My name is Paul Connett. I am a retired professor of chemistry. I taught at St. Lawrence University from 1983 and retired in May of 2006. And my speciality was environmental chemistry and toxicology. Now, how long have you been uh, looking into fluoride personally yourself? Fluoride, 15 years from 1996. What made you look? Around? My wife. Okay. Uh, three people had approached me to look into fluoridation. I, I was very involved in waste management, and I still am, 26 years. And um, uh, I had to balance the demands of teaching chemistry full-time at a university level and traveling all over the world on waste management. It's taken me to 49 states and 55 other countries. And it, during that time, I was approached three times. Somebody in Ontario, somebody in Ohio, somebody in Washington State wanted me to get involved with fluoridation. And I said, no, I was too busy with waste and incineration and uh, teaching chemistry. How, and, and also, I didn't want the issue because I knew that people were stigmatized. I mean, people are seen to be opposed to fluoridation. It's supposed to be looney tunes, crazy people. Anyway, my wife, one afternoon, she put a bunch of papers on my desk, a cup of tea, I should have been suspicious, and she says, would you read these? And I said, what is it? And she said, fluoridation. I said, Say, take, take those away, these people are crazy. She persuaded me because the village was meeting that night to decide whether they're going to continue fluoridation, so she was really anxious that I, sh she, I could tell her whether it's good or bad. And when I read those, my desire at that point was to quickly find a reason to tell her, to get off my back, that people opposed to fluoridation were crazy and these were the chemical reasons that they were off target. I had thought they were confusing fluorine, the most reactive element in the periodic table, with fluoride, which is benign. It's like confusing chlorine with sodium chloride, common salt, the element Fluorine is extremely reactive. Fluoride as a compound, chemically, is very unreactive. But there was two things which were very striking is that I've quickly found out that fluoride is extremely active biologically, it interferes with enzymes, hydrogen bonds, all kinds of things. You don't want it anywhere near your body. And the second thing I found out that afternoon was the level in mother's breast milk was extremely low. 0 0.004 parts per million, which meant a bottle-fed baby gets 200 times, in a fluoride community, gets 200 times more fluoride than a breastfed baby. And, and right away, you knew that there was something wrong here. I just don't believe that Mother Nature screwed up on, on what the baby needs. So it, it, was, it was a matter of you knew the evidence might, or the facts might be out there, but it, was, it wasn't, you really didn't want to get into it just because you, maybe you were afraid? Yeah, I was, I, was, I was afraid because I was already working on issues which were perceived as being, you know, a, a bit out there, radical, opposing incineration, municipal waste incineration, being concerned about dioxins, etc. when the, you know, the chemical industry was very, uh, determined to convince people that flu uh, the dioxin was bad for animals but it was okay for human beings. That was basically the issue in those days. So I didn't want something which would threaten my credibility still further. But as I said, I, I very quickly realized that uh, my credibility wasn't in question. It was the credibility of the government agencies in a handful of countries, of course America being the most important, who had promoted this nonsense for 60 years. I mean, there's so many things wrong with fluoridation. It's very hard to find something right about it, but what's wrong about it is, first of all, the use of the public water supply to deliver medicine is, is pretty bizarre when you think about it. Once you put a, a medicine in the drinking water, you can't control the dose because you can't control how much water people drink. You can't control who gets it, it goes to everybody. If you ask a pharmacist if there's any drug in his store that was uh, safe enough to give to everyone, young people, old people, sick people, people with poor nutrition, give it to them in any dose, they'd laugh at you. It's ridiculous. So a ridiculous practice. 
And it's been made more ridiculous by the most recent findings, which is uh, even the promoters admit now that fluoride works on the outside of the tooth, not from inside the body. There's, there is absolutely no biochemical process that's ever been shown to need fluoride. It's not an essential nutrient. And so it can only do us harm if you swallow it. Meanwhile, if you want fluoride, you've got fluoridated toothpaste, you can brush it on, a, a, treat the surface of the tooth, which is the only place it works, and once having done that, spit it out. So the, the practice does not make sense. But I think the thing that interests you and, and certainly interested me was, is it doing any harm? It's not doing any good, but is it doing any harm? And then you see the real problems here, because let's start with the, the things which nobody denies. It uh, damages the cells which lay down the enamel on the teeth and causes a condition called dental fluorosis, which is a mottling discoloration of the teeth. Well, when they started this in 1945, they thought that at one part per million, one milligram per liter, they would reduce tooth decay and at the same time only cause about 10% of the children to get this condition in its very mild form. It's less than 25% of the tooth surface. In many cases, just the, the cusp of the teeth with little white specks, and they thought that was acceptable. Today, they admit that 41% of all American children uh, aged 12 to 15, including kids living in non-fluoridated areas, now have dental fluorosis. So clearly, our children are overexposed to fluoride. So the next question is, when the fluoride is damaging the growing tooth cells, what is it doing to their other cells? The teeth grow out of the bones. So what's it doing to the bone cells? Well, we have some studies which indicate an increased risk of cortical bone defects. There are other studies which, uh, first of all, I should point out that 50% of the fluoride that we take in each day from all sources is excreted from the kidney. The other 50% accumulates largely in our bones. So what's it doing to our bones? Not immediately, and then over a lifetime. Well, immediately, the first study showed cortical bone defects, little defects in the, in the bone structure of the, out, the outer layer, which could mean increased bone fractures for children. Secondly, the first signs of fluoride poisoning of the bone in areas of the world which have naturally high levels of fluoride in the water, like India, China, parts of Africa, Mexico, parts of the Middle East, the first signs that fluoride is poisoning your bones is pains in the joints, stiffness in the joints, pains in the bones, just like arthritis. We have millions of people with arthritis in the United States and in Florida countries, one in three adults. Nobody's ever looked to see if some of those arthritis cases may have been caused or exacerbated by fluoride. Just not looking. The second issue is as the fluoride continues to accumulate in the bones, it makes the bones more brittle, it makes them harder, makes them more brittle. So we're particularly concerned about increased hip fractures in the elderly, and the studies are mixed there. Some studies say yes, some studies say, say no. But it's, it's quite a risk that you're taking, because if it's true that by the time you found that increased hip fractures, where everybody agrees, it would be too late for millions, millions of people. Now, all of those issues are important, but the one that really concerns me is the impact of fluoride on the brain. When the baby is born, the blood-brain barrier is not fully formed. In my view, this is not the time to expose the baby to 200 times the level of fluoride than in mother's milk, which is what happens if you make up baby formula with fluoridated tap water. We now have over 150 animal studies which fluoride, in which fluoride damages the brain. We have three fetal brain studies from aborted fetuses in China. They've looked at, they compared aborted fetuses from high fluoride areas with low fluoride areas and they see damage to the brain. We have behavioral studies and we have 24 IQ studies, 24 studies 
which now show an association between fairly modest exposure to fluoride and lowered IQ. Most of those are from China, but there's two from Iran, there's one from Mexico, and one from, from India. And as I, when I say modest exposures, one study from China, which is particularly interesting to me because I visited the villages in China where this study was done. They looked at a village at less than 0.7 parts per million of fluoride in the well water, natural, and another village between 2.5 and 4.5. And looking at those villages, you can't see any difference. I mean, same architecture, same, same lifestyle, same food, same diet, same occupation, all rural farmers, the same but a five to 10 IQ drop across the whole age range of, for kids. You can sh see a shift in the whole IQ and the threshold at which this occurs based upon extrapolation from all the data is 1.9 parts per million. And I've argued and will continue to argue that that means there's not an adequate margin of safety to protect the whole population of children in the United States or any other fluoridated country. After all, this study was done with 300 kids. So for 300 kids, those drinking water at 1.9 or higher have a lowered IQ. Now those children are all Chinese, all more or less the same diet, et cetera, very similar. And when you, when you take a known harm, when you see harm like this, and you now say, you ask the question, well, if that dose causes harm, what dose would be safe for a much larger population? We usually use a margin of safety of 10. We divide the harmful dose that we've found, divide by 10, to come up with what we think would be a safe dose for all the children. Some people argue that you need more than 10 if it's a, a factor affecting children because they're more sensitive. But if you apply, if you assume that those kids in the study were drinking one liter of water, that's 1.9 milligrams, if it's 1.9 parts per million, that's 1.9 milligrams per liter. If we assume they're drinking all one liter each, and this is fairly rob robust, I mean, you could assume half a liter, two liters, doesn't make much difference. If you assume that they're only drinking one liter of water, then they each were getting 1.9 milligrams, causing lowering of IQ. Apply the safety factor, 1.9 divided by 10, is 0.19 milligrams. That's one glass of water in a Florida community. It's crazy, it's reckless, it's stupid. You can't do this. But because the public health authority has promoted this in the United States for over 50 years, 60 years, it's now, it was the US Public Health Service, but now it's focused in the center of disease control. They're the big promoters of fluoridation. They have, wax lyrical about this for years and years and years. They've told everybody it's safe and effective and they just don't have what it takes to say we were wrong. And there are now dangers there. And they could throw in the fact that it's unnecessary because if you want fluoride, you know, use fluoridated toothpaste. Right. And I, I mean, I, I remember growing up and, and going through uh, to the dentist's office and getting my fluoride treatment as a kid and the gel that they made you bite into and threatened you not to swallow it and panic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't swallow that. Swallow yeah, children have died, you know. Right. There's been a case of a child who swallowed this. The dentist left the room. The parents didn't know. The kid swallowed it. it. Had to be rushed to hospital. They couldn't save him. He died. So, yeah, it's very toxic substance. There's no question about that. Question, have you seen these, um, these baby water bottles with fluoride yeah. added? Now, it's criminal. It's criminal. Yeah, but nursery water. It's, 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 it's telling parents that you need to give this to your babies. You, you need to use this water to, to make up formula. Even the ADA, which is gung-ho promoter of fluoridation, has said to its own membership, they put out an e-gram in November the 9th, 2006, which said, if you're making up baby formula, uh, use either no fluoride or low fluoridated water. Don't use fluoridated tap water. But they're not getting that warning to parents. Why is that, you think? Well, I think they're, they're worried about threatening the water fluoridation program. Once you, once you put out the notion that fluoridated water is not safe for babies, come on, how are you going to tell all the parents? Yeah. 
How are you going to help the parents with low income to use an alternative water source? No, they realize that this is a threat to the water fluoridation program and their solution is to not to tell people. I think the people have the, the strength to, to get the, the tap shut off, the fluoride shut off? Well, this is what I, I tell people, that I'm not suggesting to you that fluoride is the greatest threat to human health on this planet. It's not. There are other health issues which I'm very concerned about, like obesity, vaccinations, and so on. But this is the easiest issue to end once we have the political will. If you have the political will on this issue, you can turn off the spigot at the waterworks and it's over. It's done. But to turn off that spigot, you need the political will. Mm -hmm. And to get the political will, we need masses of people informed and organized. And at the moment, they're not. We don't have masses of people. We, we have a growing number. We have a growing number of professionals, over, over 3,700 who said stop fluoridation. We have thousands, we have many hundreds of communities that have stopped fluoridation. So we know it's possible. Even cities like Calgary in Alberta stopped uh, this year, uh, stopped fluoridation. So we know it's possible to stop, but you, you do need people informed and you need them organized. Internet is, is important and getting videotapes like this on the internet are important. Awareness. Awareness, absolutely. That's why we're here. Um, I had a question too because you know I remember re reading um, and listening to some of your your uh, previous interviews. And why is it that minorities are more susceptible? Is it is it a genetic thing or is it just the well? Genetic? It's not absolutely certain, but we do know it's a fact. For example, the Center of Disease Control in the 2005 report indicates that Black Americans and Mexican Americans had a higher rate of dental fluorosis than white children. Now, there, there, there are many reasons for this, I think. Maybe it's a factor of lower income, because lower income families are more likely to have a, a poorer diet, and a poorer diet makes fluoride's toxicity worse. So that's one factor. There's another factor, lactose intolerance. There's a higher rate of lactose intolerance in Mexican-Americans and even higher in the black community. If you have lactose intolerance, you drink less milk. You get less milk, you get less calcium. You drink less milk, you may be drinking more water. Right. More water means more fluoride. Um, Isn't the fluoride in the milk as well, though? No. No, not in cow's milk. No, it's, this is the same as the human milk. That, that nature seems to have a filter. It doesn't get into milk. Is that right? Yeah. So cow's milk is low and, and human milk is even lower. Right. Yeah. So that there are a number of reasons. And then when you get into adults, there's a higher rate of kidney disease in, in black Americans. And if you've got poor kidney function, you can't get rid of the fluoride. 50%, a normal kidney gets rid of 50% each day. But an impaired kidney less and so the fluoride is building up in your body faster um, so kidney function uh, higher rates of diabetes and uh, some forms of diabetes people drink a lot of water so they may be drinking more water for that reason so all kinds of reasons in addition to you know having it forced into our our water supply what other uses are there for fluoride that we would need i mean that you would see it what <laughs> no, I mean, look, it has many uses in industry from etching glass to uh, g making silicon products to oil refineries to in met metallurgy, lowering the melting points of, of uh, metal ores and, and so on. Yeah, it has many, many uses in industry, but in the body, there's, as I said earlier, there is no known use of fluoride in the body. They've never been able to demonstrate a sickness which has occurred because of lack of fluoride. They've never demonstrated biochemically that there's any process in the body that needs fluoride. It's the only place where it seems that fluoride has some kind of possible role is in hardening the enamel. But it's a, it's a topical effect. It doesn't work through the 
gums into the teeth and it works on the outside of the teeth. Right. And in fact, it, that once the enamel is formed, it's essentially dead tissue. So we're talking about a, a chemical interaction with dead tissue, hardening it. Once the, once the fluoride is exchanged with the hydroxide ion, it makes the acid, hard, the enamel harder, more resistant to acid attack. And the acids come from the breakdown of sugars by bacteria in the mouth. Has the, the ADA and the FDA and, and everybody at CDC, are they all on the same page as far as too much fluoride causes dental fluorosis? Yeah, there's no argument about dental fluorosis. That's been, been um, we know, we've known that since 1931, right. that fluoride causes dental fluorosis. The argument today is whether this constitutes simply a cosmetic effect which may uh, impact a child's self-esteem, they're having what looks like uncared for teeth, markings, discoloration, or, or whether this is a, is a health effect. And, and some of us would argue that if you impact a child's self-esteem, uh, this has psychological impact. So that is, in fact, a medical effect. But the National Research Council said that severe dental fluorosis is, in fact, a health effect because it weakens the teeth and makes them more vulnerable to, to tooth decay. You would think that right there would be enough to... You would think so, with 41%. <laughs> would be enough to, all right, next, it's, it's supposed to be in there. Yeah. Putting it in there to, uh, you know, to improve the teeth, not going yeah. the opposite direction. But yeah. We were talking, uh, we are going to touch on the, the, the metallics. The yeah. Well, one of the things that we know about fluoride is that it, it very avidly forms complexes it, with metal ions. It surrounds metal ions in, in patterns, very stable complexes and these are almost separate entities so with uh, aluminum for instance the fluoride surrounds the aluminum ion and you get these complexes for example ALF4 four fluoride ions around an aluminum ion it's pretty stable and it turns out that this aluminum fluoride ion is the same shape and more or less the same size as the phosphate ion and the phosphate ion has incredible importance in biology. So if the ALF4 has the potential to mimic phosphate, it could be very serious indeed. The one place it showed up is in the fact that fluoride actually triggers G proteins, which probably sounds like nonsense there. But G proteins is a system whereby messages which arrive at the outside of the cell are able to cross the, the cell into the inside of the cell. So if you have a, a, a messenger that can't cross the membrane itself, it's got to have a way of getting that message across the, the membrane. And that message is carried by G proteins. And when the messenger arrives, the G protein is switched on. I keep it simple. When the messenger arrives, the G protein is switched on, and that triggers the inside messenger to do what it has to do. It turns out that aluminum fluoride, ALF4 minus, will switch on the G proteins without the messenger arriving, without the neurotransmitter, without the hormone, without the growth factor arriving. So it's mimicking these messages, really important messages. And uh, fortunately for us, the level at which this occurs is fairly high and you would need perhaps the concentrations that you get in bones and teeth uh, and maybe the pineal gland before you get to concentrations where these G proteins are excited. But potentially it's very serious, especially for the interface between bones and um, uh, uh, the hard tissues and, and the soft tissues. So that's just one example, but there, there are potentially many other examples where fluoride is combining with, it, it for, combines with calcium. Calcium is incredibly important in the body. It's very important for, for brain messages and so on, neurological. Uh, you know, the whole transmission of nerves is based upon calcium signals. Um, and another one is uh, fluoride, metal, oh, lead. It is may... It absorption rate? Yes, it, the, it would appear that fluoride increases the uptake of lead into the blood, or in particular, the, one of the chemicals that we use, the, the most 
frequently use chemical to fluoridate is not sodium fluoride, but hexafluorosilicic acid, silicon fluorides. And these silicon fluorides seem to form a, a complex with lead. Anyway, when you're using silicon fluorides, they, the epidemiology, using the silicon fluorides for fluoridating, there's a higher increase in lead levels in the blood. It seems to increase the uptake of lead from any, different, any source, environmental source, lead paint or whatever, increases the uptake from the gut into the bloodstream. That's very serious indeed. Now, that was two large epidemiological studies. Recently, there was an animal study that tested this on rats. They fed the rats lead acetate, and they got one level in the blood. And then they gave the, the rats, other rats, lead acetate and hexafluorosilicic acid. And lo and behold, like a six-fold increase in the amount of lead in the blood and uh, dentine and, and so on. You know, in addition to all of that, fluoride has, as I said, the ability to form these complexes. And the concern is it will suck metals out of various combinations. Like, could it help to suck the mercury out of mercury amalgams in the mouth if you're drinking fluoridated water or you're swishing fluoride or you're using fluoridated toothpaste. Maybe that helps to erode the mercury from the amalgam. Lead pipes. Uh, maybe uh, fluoride helps to get lead out of the pipes or even the brass fittings. There's been a study which shows that uh, fluoride in combination with chloramine and other chlorinating uh, agents seems to facilitate the, the solution of lead from pipe joints. And also we know that if you boil water in an aluminium saucepan, if you're using fluoridated water, more aluminum goes into solution. So, it, you know, there's all these worrying ways that fluoride can make the situation worse with metals which already are a question mark. You mentioned solutions. What, what, what can the average person do to, to, to better their lives and to maybe to avoid the, the fluoride? What, what do you do? What, what are some pointers? Uh, how do you live your life? Is it maybe your diet or your intake? Your well, okay, first of all, we, it took us seven and a half years to get fluoride out of our water supply. And, and that's the, the best thing you can do, is to work with other citizens to stop this foolish practice. Get it out of your, your community. And then you can drink the water at home, you can drink the water in your office, you can drink the water in the restaurants and in friends' houses and so on. You don't have to worry anymore. So that's the ideal. But to, you know, to get that fluoride out, you need the political will. To get the political will, you need people informed, people organized. Now, if you can't do that, what we did is that we bought these large five-gallon uh, containers of water from a large supermarket and then had these cooling towers and fed it down. And you could, uh, we used that for cooking and for drinking. However, we were still bathing in this stuff still showering in. I don't know how much we absorbed. And what really upset my wife is she's a keen organic gardener and she did not like having to be being forced to spray the fluoridated water on the fruit and vegetables. And then the other thing is that when you went to other people's houses, they may not go to these lengths. And so you're, you're drinking it there. And I know when I went to work, I had umpteen cups of coffee a day. Every time I was using the the tap water. Tap water is fluoridated. It's like everything else, you know, what we've learned um, as far as uh, the bottled water industry and, and, and for that matter, anything, anything packaged with, with water in it, um, be it orange yeah. juice or, mm -hmm. or, or uh, you know, Gatorades or, you know, these, these sport drinks or yeah. uh, soda pops and, uh, I mean, you name it, it's got it. It's well, wherever... Wherever these, these beverages that you're talking about are made in fluoridated communities, right. the chances are high they've used fluoridated water. So you're going to get the fluoride from those sources. If they're making processed foods, they're going to get fluoridated fluoride into the, uh, into the food. It's concentrated with boiling. And also, um, we're getting fluoride from pesticide residues. So all in all, we're being bombarded with fluoride. We don't have a situation in this country where fluoride, where children are getting too little fluoride. We know that from the dental fluorosis rates. 
our situation is we're getting our kids overexposed to fluoride. And they, they accept and they recognize that dental fluorosis is a problem, but they deny any other health effect. Do you think that the, 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 um, the smoking gun, or, or, or I should say, uh, the most dangerous part of fluoridation, would it be the neurological damage? Would it be the physical? That's the one I'm most concerned about because it's very subtle. And it's the subtle effects which take you a very long time to, de to demonstrate. And by the time you demonstrate, it's too late for millions of kids. That's what happened with lead. It took us years to convince the scientific community or, or people like Needleman. It, th there were, back in the, in the middle 70s, there were many scientists who said, we know that large exposure, heavy exposure to lead causes brain damage in children. Uh, sufficient to bring the, ch the parents to bring the children to hospitals and clinics because there's something wrong with the kids. But they said it's highly likely that you're going to get subtle effects on the brain that the parent is not going to notice. And so they were concerned in the 70s with subclinical effects of lead that would take very careful experimentation to demonstrate. And I think the fluoride actually is where lead was today, uh, where, where lead was in the 70s. In other words, it's just a question of, of having people do more and more sophisticated analyses to demonstrate subtle changes in brain development. We're not there yet. Well, we're close. We're close in area in countries which don't have a fluoridation program to protect. And unfortunately, we're not doing the studies in the United States because the health agencies are more interested in protecting, I'm sad to say this, seem to be more interested in protecting this program and their reputations and their credibility than protecting our children, which is pretty sad. But that's the most rational explanation of why they're not doing these most basic studies. Kind of to keep the, uh, the, the big boiling machine running, right? Whatever. Whatever. It's very difficult to go into motivation. Motivation yeah. is difficult. It's difficult enough to know why you, you do the things that <laughs> we do as individuals, but trying to understand why other people do, do things. It looks very irrational, but for me, the most rational explanation of all this irrational behavior is that they are now more interested in protecting the fluoridation program than protecting our health. No, I, I thought, well, there's some money involved. There are obviously some interests uh, in, well, first of all, the phosphate fertilizer industry. The, the, the chemicals we use to fluoridate the water are not pharmaceutical grade. They're not the same grade that we put in toothpaste. They're, it's the hazardous waste of the phosphate fertilizer industry. They can't dump that into the sea by international law. It's too concentrated to dump locally. How does the phosphate industry um, produce fluoride? Well, there's a lot of fluoride in the phosphate rock. The, the phosphate fertilizer industry, they dig up this rock. This rock is largely insoluble in water, so it's no good uh, as, as is. So you mix it with sulfuric acid, and this produces soluble phosphate, and that's what becomes the fertilizer. Uh, but in the process of mixing with sulfuric acid, it releases two very toxic gases, hydrogen fluoride and silicon tetrafluoride. For a hundred years, they decimated the local vegetation, crippled the cattle, damaged the citrus groves in Florida, and then eventually they were forced to put cleaning devices, wet scrubbers, a spray of water. And that spray of water converts these gases into hexafluorosilicic acid, that's a mouthful, contaminated with a whole bunch of other stuff. And that's the stuff that is taken from the scrubbers, put into tanker trucks and shipped around the country and put into our water. So not only is the public water supply being used to deliver medicine, which is a lousy medical practice because you can't control the dose, and who gets it, but it's also being used to get rid of hazardous waste. It's a hazardous waste management tool. It's bizarre. I mean, George Orwell, Kafka could have written this play. It's, it's, it's lunacy. So why is it, you know, that Europe is uh, supposedly 98% fluoride-free, whereas in America we're 75 and percent That's growing? right. Yeah, most people in America are persuaded that everybody fluoridates their water. And you, if you're living in a town like Albany or Long Island or Ithaca or somewhere, 
or Portland uh, or Spokane, uh, you're meant to believe that you're behind the, the ball here. You, you're, you know, you're against progress. You're, you're not doing the right thing. But the vast majority of the population in the world does not drink fluoridated water. Most of the countries do not fluoridate their water. Only about 30. And most of Europe, 98% of Europe, does not fluoridate. Only eight countries in the world have more than 50% of their population drinking water. America, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Israel, Singapore, Malaysia, and Colombia. Only eight. Now, the reasons, there's two main reasons why European countries explain why they never went along with this American practice. One was they didn't feel it was right to force it on people that didn't want it. And secondly, uh, they didn't think that all the health issues had been resolved. And that's, that's still the case. The health issues have not been resolved. If anything, the health issues have got more and more serious and, and more and more evidence that they exist. And um, it was explained to me by people in the Netherlands, so particularly Dan, Dr. Hans Muhlenberg. He said, you know, in the Netherlands, we know what it's like as a country to lose your freedom, to live in a totalitarian society, which was run by the Nazis because the Nazis overran Netherlands. And so we know what it's like. And, uh, and we who pride ourselves in freedom in the glorious United States, we've allowed this very important freedom to be bulldozed out of our lives. You are meant to have the right to informed consent to medication. What we're doing in a fluoridated community is we're doing to everyone what a doctor can do to no one. A doctor who says, says to you, he says, look, this glass of water is going to do wonderful things for you. It's going to cure your ingrowing toenails. It's going to make you less bald. It's going to do X, Y, and Z. Drink it. And you say, no, I don't want to drink it. You must drink it. You've got to drink it. I'm, I'm your doctor. I'm telling you, you've got to drink it. If he or she tried to do that to you, he or she could lose their license. You're not. You've got to tell the, the patient what the drug is good for. You've got to tell them what it's bad for, the side effects. And then they, in theory, make up their minds. This has been ripped away from us. There's so many bizarre levels in this whole issue, but one of them is the Food and Drug Administration that, that regulates medicine in this country. There's never regulated fluoride, either as a, a medication, a, a prescription medication, you know, like vitamin tablets with fluoride in them, or for fluoride in the drinking water. They just wash their hands of this. And, so, uh, uh, and what this has meant, because the FDA has never regulated this, they've never required a randomized clinical trial to demonstrate effectiveness or safety. And, that, and, and over, after over 60 years, there has not been a single randomized clinical trial. The gold standard for testing drugs has never been applied to fluoride, either for effectiveness or safety. And it turns out when you pursue this, that whilst there are agencies that promote this, like the Oral Health Division of the Center for Disease Control, they support and promote fluoridation all over the country. They give prizes and awards to individuals that are successful getting mandatory fluoridation or uh, put the fluoride in the water, blah, blah, blah. They don't accept any responsibility for it. The EPA regulates contaminants in the water but does not regulate additives. So the FDA doesn't regulate fluoridation. The EPA does not regulate fluoridation. The CDC promotes it but doesn't accept responsibility for it. And when you're looking for, well, who is in charge, it turns out to be a private entity called the National Sanitation Foundation. Well, just want to thank you okay. know, Dr. Paul <laughs> Connor for taking the time to to sit with us here and, and uh, enlighten us a little bit more on our journey uh, down this, this road of fluoride. Is it good or bad? Or yeah. 
Um, I just uh, again I appreciate everything that you've, that you've done uh, you've done for us uh, here today and, and for the community uh, and, mm. uh, and everything that you do do. So thank you so much for that. Well, it's a it's a pleasure to talk to you, and and I'm hoping that this will get the message to more and more people. Remember, this this is the practice which is easy. This is one issue that is as easy to stop as turning off a tap. But to turn off that tap, we need more people informed and more people organized to get the political will to do that. Good. Okay.